would like to talk about Cartano subalgebras. And C star algebra. So, really, the goal for the talk is to advertise this notion of the Cartan subalgebra in the C star algebraic context. Um, so, this notion is due to Kumjian and Benoit, and the motivation actually comes from von Neumann algebras, as you will see. And what I would like to do is I would like to explain why this notion of a Cartan subalgebra is interesting. For instance, if we want to connect operator algebras and dynamical systems. But also, it could be interesting for classification of C-star algebras. OK. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. Let me first of all tell you what a Cartan subalgebra is. So here's the definition. In this form, due to Renault. Um, so first of all, I should say all the C-star algebras in this talk are supposed to be separable. I don't mention it. So we say that an abelian sub C star algebra B of the C star algebra A is a Cartan sub algebra. We have the following conditions. So first thing is that B should contain an approximate unit of A. So it's not too small. Second, and that's what you would expect from the name, B should be maximal abelian. Third property is that B should be regular. So what this means is the following. So we look at the normalizers of B and A. So by definition, these are all the elements in A, such that if I take them and conjugate uh, them, conjugate B with them, so if I do this, then I land in B again. And same for N star. So the, prop the condition is that this set should generate A as a C star algebra. And one last condition is for that we want to have a faithful conditional expectation from A onto B. Okay, so that's the definition of a Cartan subalgebra. Uh, one side remark is that I mean, in four, we just asked for the existence of a faithful condition expectation. But given all these other properties, this faithful condition expectation will actually be unique. So there will only be one. And OK, so just notation. So we, we call this pair AB a Cartan pair. What it means? It's a completely positive map, uh, unit uh, well from one, and it's if you apply it twice, it's the same as applying it once. So it has this item positive property. Uh, 
All right. Yeah, so as I said before, if you know, I mean, there is a notion of a Cartan pair or Cartan subalgebra in the von Neumann context, which is older than this one. And if you compare them, you see that this is really the Cisse algebraic version of that. So it's very analogous. So let me give you one class of examples. which is, if you want, the canonical class of examples. So we take a topological dynamical system. So just say it's countable discrete group gamma acting on a locally compact Hausdorff space X. Um, let's say second countable. We have separable CISA algebras. And we assume that the system is what's called topologically free. So this means whenever I have a group element, it's not the identity, then I look at the elements in my space which are not fixed by this group element. And I want this to be dense in X. Yeah, so for example, if the action is free, there are no stabilizers, this is certainly the case, but in general, this is weaker. So in that situation, you can look at C0 of x, and this will then be a Cartan subalgebra of the reduced cross product. So it gives us already quite a few examples. And actually, I mean, most of the conditions are not that hard to check. So one, three, and four in this setting, they basically follow uh, uh, from the way we construct the reduced cross product. It's only for two where we need topologically free. Okay. And as I said, so this already builds a bridge to dynamical systems, and I will come back to this later on. One more example, which generalizes the first one. So let G be the Natal and topologically principal groupoid. So Ital means just that the range and source maps are local homeomorphisms. And topologically principal means that, so I can look at the elements in the unit space of my groupoid, uh, which satisfy the property that if I look at the arrows in my groupoid, which start from this element and end at this element, so this is just a stabilizer group, then this should be nothing else but the element itself. And we want this subspace to be dense in the unit space. Okay, so then again, if we have such a groupoid, then C0 of the unit space is a Cartan subalgebra of the reduced groupoid Cista algebra. Yeah, and the reason I say it's the generalization of the first example is because if you take 
given a system, you take the transformation group for it, then first of all you see that the system is topologically free if and only if the group is topological principle. And then the statement I wrote here it precisely gives you this statement in the first example. Okay. So now these are two types of examples and the second one is more general. But you might still think that this is a rather special kind of account pair. But actually, that's not the case. So this is almost the most general thing you can get. So the theorem is usually we know is the following. So C algebra A with a sub algebra B is a Poisson pair. If and only if there exists an entire <coughs> topological principle groupoid for the G. <coughs> and now we want a bit extra, namely we want to allow a twist. So by this I mean a groupoid extension of the form that we start with the circle across the unit space, <coughs> embed this into something bigger, bigger groupoid, and this projects down to our given group point. <coughs> so just the twist of the original group point, and then we have that the pair is isomorphic to the C star but attached to the twist together with the, the zero function on the unit space. Uh, so without going into details, you can think of this twist as being a line bundle over your group point, which is at the same time a cell bundle. And for such a thing, there is a construction of this reduced C star algebra, which is really very analogous to the usual group point C star algebra. In particular, the unit space, the functions on them, sits inside here. And it will be a Cartan pair, the thing on the right. And Renault's theorem says that these kind of Cartan pairs, they actually realize all possible Cartan pairs. So up to a twist, the example I gave is actually the most general case you can have. And of course, I should say that if the twist is trivial, in the sense that the extension is trivial, then you just get as a C star algebra here, the usual group by C star algebra. Okay, maybe I should try this.
Okay, so that was the general part about Cartan subalgebras. Now let me build a bridge to dynamical systems. So the basic question I would like to study is this. So say you have two topological dynamical systems as before. And we know we can construct the reduced cross product. Now the question is, in general terms, well, what sort of information do these cross products capture about the dynamical system? Or asked a bit more concretely, if we know that the cross products are isomorphic as C-size, what does it tell us about the dynamical system, say? So of course, at this point, it's a very hard question. I mean, in general, it's not clear at all what we would expect. So to get some inspiration, let's look at the von Neumann case, where you can ask a very similar question. So let's look at the von Neumann case. So here we study not topological, but measurable dynamical systems, and we form the von Neumann cross product. And for to be on the safe side, let's assume that our systems are free and ergodic. So there, I mean, as there's always the strongest notion, so to say, to compare dynamical systems, and that's what's called conjugacy. Yeah, so identification of the spaces of the groups which intertwines the action. So that's, I mean, the strongest equivalent. And again, as for C algebras, you can have a weak or equivalence involving operator algebras, let's say the von Neumann equivalent, by which I just mean that the von Neumann cross product is isomorphic. And in the von Neumann setting, you can connect the two by putting something here intermediate. And that's what's called always equivalent. Uh, so you want to identify the base spaces, not maybe respecting the group actions, but at least respecting the orbit structure. And, well, that you can go from here to here is clear. To explain why you can go from here to here what one way to explain it is to observe that orbit equivalence can be described in terms of operator algebras, namely by saying that the von Neumann Cartan pairs are isomorphic. Uh, so, by this I mean you take the von Neumann cross product. An infinity of the measure space sits inside there as a Cartan subalgebra, and you want to have isomorphism of such pairs. That's equivalent to orbit equivalence. So, this is an old result going back to Singer and Feldman Moore. And basically, what I would like to explain is what the topological or C algebraic version of this thing in the middle is. So the definition is as follows. Uh, we start again with two topological dynamical systems. And then we say that these are continuously
orbit equivalent, I just write DOE for this. If we can find the homeomorphism of the base spaces, um, I mean, for orbital equivalence, what we certainly want is that it respects the orbit. But since we call it continuously orbit equivalent, we want this to happen in a continuous way. And that's what I'm going to make precise now. So together with continuous maps, uh, call them little phi from gamma cross x to lambda and from uh, another one from lambda cross y gamma such that we have the following identities so if I take capital phi and apply it to a group element applied to x then I want this to be uh, a little phi of gx applied to capital phi of x or g for x and the other map is supposed to have the same property for the inverse of capital phi. Just to make it symmetric. Uh, so if you look at the identities, they certainly make sure that orbits are spent to orbits. But as I say, these extra maps make sure that you can choose the group element in a continuous way. So since I wrote this definition, I now claim that this is really the topological or C-star algebraic version of orbit equivalence in the von Neumann class. And the justification is the following observation. So let's take two dynamical systems. Um, topological dynamic systems which are supposed to be topologically free. Then the following are equivalent. Um, so first thing is that these two systems are continuously orbit equivalent. Second thing is that the transformation group points I get from these systems are isomorphic as topological group points. And thirdly, that the Cartan pairs Uh, 
Ah, essa é móvel. Um, yeah, so by this I just mean, as I said, you can find an isomorphism of the cross products identifying the abelian subalgebra. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, let me add one more item to this list. So, for notation, let's call such a map phi, such a homomorphism. We call it a continuous orbit equivalence between our dynamical systems. And uh, so with this notation, let me add one more. So in a special case, um, so yes, yes. So let's assume the restricted case here that my two dynamical systems are free um, to be on the safe side let's assume that gamma and lambda are infinite groups and let's say that x and y are particular spaces so let's say that x and y isomorphic to, uh, homeomorphic to y <coughs> is a Cantor space So in this situation, then the statements above are equivalent to the statement. Um, so I can look at those homomorphisms on X of X, which are continuous orbit equivalences between gamma x on x and gamma and x on x. So just for the same system. So I get a subgroup of homeomorphisms. And what this really means is that phi well, will be a homomorphism from x to x, respecting the orbit, and it does so in a continuous way, as I explained. And I can take the same group for uh, my second dynamical system. And the statement is that these are isomorphic as abstract groups. So just the algebraic surface. Now, so the reason I wrote this last statement is because these groups I defined are the so-called full groups. And already in the, in the case of counter minima systems, where the groups here are just the integers, and x and y are the counter space, these groups have quite interesting properties. So in dynamical systems, they have been studied quite a lot recently. Well, if they're finite, you could have finite orbits and then this, well, just to be cautious. I mean, yeah. so you need in the proof that you might, I mean, you don't have too small orbits. So Yeah, so that's exactly the point. So this will be automatic. If they are isomorphic as abstract groups in this situation, 
I mean, these conditions basically ensure that you can find homomorphism. Yes, so then you just basically have one system. So small phi would go from gamma cross x to gamma. And satisfying this. So basically, you can think of such COEs as being piecewise patched together from the group X. So you have sloping sets. And uh, each of the sloping sets, you just take a, just one single group element, group X. And you piece them together to get a global homomorphism. Okay, so that's the justification why I say that that the C or E, the continuous orbital equivalence, is the replacement for what we have in the middle for von Neumann algebras. So, at least formally, we have the same situation now as for von Neumann algebras. Um, so we have the strongest version of the equivalence for topological dynamical systems now. It implies continuous orbit equivalence, and that implies C star equivalence, as for von Neumann algebras. Right. So that's where we are at the moment. Now, if we again draw inspiration from the von Neumann algebra case, it's, I mean, there the question has been studied for which dynamical systems it's actually possible to go back uh, from here to here or from here to here. So there's been some really remarkable work by Popa and co authors um, studying this question for Neumann algebra. And at least because formally it's the same situation, you can ask the same question for a C star algebra from topological dynamical systems. And as far as I know, there's not much uh, work, there's not much work on this so far. That's why I'm giving this talk uh, in this conference on future, future direct. Um, but let me at least mention some special cases. So one particular case which has been studied a lot is the case of quantum minimal systems. So by this I mean you take just integer actions on the quantum space. So the work I have in mind is the work of Giordano Putnam Skow and also Giordano Matui Putnam Skow maybe in various combinations. So one thing you can observe for such systems is looking at the first arrow. Here, actually, conjugacy <coughs> and continuous orbit equivalence are the same thing. So that's the particular case where you can go back. It's actually more general. You can prove that if you look at integer actions on compact spaces, you can always get some continuous orbit equivalence back to conjugacy. Right. But uh, if you change the data a little bit, 
no matter whether they change it here or here, it turns out to be not true. So let's just give some examples, but not for, okay, so let's first change the space a bit. So let y be what's called the locally compact house of Hamper space. So it shares all the properties of the counter space, totally disconnected, no isolated points, but it's not compact, only locally compact. Then it's not true. And it's also not true if you have two commuting actions on the counter space. Or if you want to have something really non-commutative on the group side, you can also take uh, free groups acting on the counter space. Um, I mean, in the classical Giordano Putnam scale case, it would be free. Yeah. But I mean, here usually topological <coughs> free would be enough. Yeah. Right. So in all these other cases, you can find examples of continuously orbit equivalent systems which are not con conjugate. And well, it depends on what kind of person you are, but in some sense, this is good news because. I mean, if you find out that continuous orbit equivalence is exactly the same as conjugacy in all cases, then it's, well, one surprising big result, but then it's boring. So now at least there's something to do here. And uh, yeah, for the future. All right. Um, let's talk also briefly about the other direction. So if you want to understand whether you can go from C star equivalence to continuous orbit equivalence, the question is really about uniqueness of Cartan subalgebra. Maybe uniqueness of the automorphism or inner automorphism. That's really very much like in the von Neumann case. And again, it's, as far as I know, there's not much work that has been done on this question. Um, except for two particular cases I know of. So one case is the classical case of AF algebras. There's been work of Wojcicki and Stratila some time ago. So they show every AF algebra has a canonical Cartan subalgebra. And then more recently, there's been work on graph algebras. And there also, people show there is a canonical Cartan subalgebra, and they show how to characterize it. But as I say, these are the only special cases I know. Uh, so far, I think it's for one, yeah, yeah the classical case. Okay. So, for the second arrow, we're only interested in the question about uniqueness of Cartan subalgebra. Because, well, if we start with dynamical systems, the existence question, that's guaranteed, right? We always have a canonical subalgebra, which is a Cartan subalgebra. So the existence question is not interesting here. But in the rest of my talk, what I would like to explain is that for the purpose of classification, the existence question might also be interesting. The, uh, so the question, given an abstract C-star algebra, whether there is a Cartan subalgebra or not. And the reason why it might be interesting is that the existence question turns out to be connected to the UCT. Um, so that's short for universal coefficient theorem. And let me just uh, briefly say what it is. So separable C star algebra A satisfies the UCT if for every separable C star algebra B, you have a short exact sequence um, where we start with the KK group of AB. From there, using Kasparov product, we have a canonical homomorphism to a hom of the K groups. So 
So the requirement is, first of all, that this should be surjective. But not only that, we also want to control the kernel. So the kernel should be given by the X group. Okay, so A. And here I have to allow for an index shift. So you want such short exact sequences as this. And, okay, so it's known that, well, basically all the CSAR algebras you can construct from elementary building blocks satisfy the UPC. But for instance, it's an open problem still whether all separable nuclear CSAR algebras satisfy the UPC. And particular people in classification, they care about this question. Because, well, if you want to prove classification results, ideally what you would like to prove is, if you give me two C-star algebras which have isomorphic K-theory, I want them to be isomorphic as C-star algebras. So the first step is, if you have an isomorphism here, which lives here, the first step is to lift it to an invertible KK element. And for that, you need the UCT. So that's why it's a crucial step in the classification. So the reason why this is connected to the notion of Cartan subalgebras is the following observation. A separable nuclear C star algebra, which has a Cartan subalgebra, satisfies. Yeah, so that's why the existence question is also relevant. Um, I don't have much time. Let me just say it. So in the proof, yes, well, yeah. L let me first of all say something about the proof and then come back to this. Um, so for the proof, we use this, first of all, this result of Renault characterizing Cartan pairs. Then you're almost in the groupoid case. And then we use the result of Chu saying that for a nuclear groupoid C star algebras, we know that they satisfy the UCT. Right. But coming back to this, actually it turns, for instance, it turns out that the UCT problem then can be reformulated. And it turns out to be equivalent to the statement that, well, every unit to Kirchberg algebra, so that's a particular class of CSTAR algebras, with finitely generated K groups, that they all have a Cartan subalgebra. So that turns out to be equivalent to the UCT problem. Okay. So at least if the UCT is true, then we have a lot of examples of CSTAR algebras with Cartan subalgebra. Okay, that's it. Yeah, that's actually not so clear. Um, yeah. So it seems more to be known on the purely infinite side than on the finite side. But yeah, that's certainly an interesting question. So on infinity, it certainly does, yeah. yeah. UHF also do. It's basically the Cartan subalgebra. Any questions? Complex. What what place did it go? The assumption that Cantor space. Or? Yeah. 
that's yeah. So that's just basically it's for a sort of trivial reason because our groups are assumed to be discrete. So actually, I forgot to mention, but if you take this definition of continuous orbit theorem and you assume the underlying spaces to be connected, then continuous orbit equivalence will always be the same as conjugacy. But that's only due to the fact that we are looking at discrete groups. So you could look at topological groups, and this has not been studied as far as I know. And then it would be more interesting. Well, the totally disconnected case, I don't know whether that's, uh, it's not, yeah. But that's a limitation due to the, our convention. It's just not. Uh, is separable nuclear? Do we want nuclear? Because then, <laughs> then it's connected to this. Uh, uh, that's actually not. 